those are not working and not recovering. Um, the longest patient just got off. Uh, our first patient was on the ECMO circuit for about uh, four and a, almost four weeks, uh, which is amazing to think that you could be on, have all your blood outside your body going through a, uh, a pump oxygenator for four weeks and still survive that. Um, so uh, thank heavens for technology. <clears throat> Let me uh, go forward with the slides here. And <clears throat> we're going to be talking about cardiovascular disease in the COVID era. Um, I get called as an interventional cardiologist, <clears throat> excuse me, very often for um, take care of patients who uh, we believe have an ST elevation MI. Um, so we get called to the emergency room a lot. Um, you know, so when we see patients uh, and we're called to evaluate patients like this, um, the EKG, the initial EKG may look like a classical STEMI, uh, but oftentimes it is not. Probably up to 50% of the time that you think you have a STEMI, you really do not. Sometimes the EKGs may appear like a bundle branch block or widened uh, intraventricular conduction defect. Um, some patients have diffuse ST elevations without the reciprocal depressions, uh, mimicking some sort of a myocard myocarditis or pericarditis picture. So when you evaluate these patients, you have to ask yourself, how are they presenting? Are they presenting like a classical STEMI, which we should rush and do what we normally do, take them to a cath lab, try to get in there and open up an artery with primary PCI? Or are they presenting with flu-like syndromes? Do they have classical chest pain? Um, the chest pain that they have may be less impressive than the diffuse ST elevations that you see. Sometimes you see patients whose EKGs look awful, but they're not complaining dramatically about chest pain. So when you have those kind of syndromes, <clears throat> think very cautiously about whether or not your patient has COVID. Uh, and then if you do think they have COVID, how are you gonna take them to the cath lab? What kind of protection are you gonna give <clears throat> to your staff uh, and to the lab to keep your staff uh, healthy? Because um, we have limited staff for our STEMI program. And if our staff was to get infected, um, that may shut down <clears throat> the entire um, uh, program of, of acute MI care. <clears throat> we know that there's a lot of myocardial injury in the COVID patient. It's not just the ST elevations that we're seeing. There are high enzyme releases. If you mention troponins, you'll see a large troponin bump. Um, some of these patients are presenting what looks like cardiomyopathies, myocarditis, pericarditis. Uh, the cardiomyopathies that they present with can be global, and I'll show you some examples of that. It can involve the left ventricle. It can involve the right ventricle or both. And it can also present like a Takasubo syndrome. <clears throat> One of the biggest things that we've discovered, uh, and I, I know you have as well, is the patients are in a hypercoagulable state. Um, these patients develop extensive blood clots. They get coronary thrombosis, and it's very, very difficult to treat. Um, you know, the, the, a clot is the nemesis of the interventional cardiologist trying to put stents or balloons into clotted up blood vessels um, oftentimes is, is much less successful than it would be in a standard case of uh, atherosclerotic or ruptured plaque. Um, our patients have also developed peripheral arterial disease. We will see patients who have uh, cold extremities, uh, you know, due to embolic uh, thrombosis that then embolizes to a distal circulation, such as a foot or a leg. Uh, we've had patients who require uh, urgent intervention and those who've had even amputation. Um, deep vein thrombosis is very, very common. Um, my 55-year-old colleague uh, was scanned because he had pain in his leg. In fact, two of my doctors uh, had uh, deep vein thrombosis clots uh, due to the COVID uh, virus. <clears throat> and when you see patients who are doing relatively okay and then all of a sudden, suddenly crash and take a turn for the worse, always think about pulmonary artery embolisms. Very, very common during this syndrome. <clears throat> it's important to be able to treat them aggressively with anticoagulation, firm, um, fibrinolytic therapy if need be, or actually uh, aspiration to remove large uh, pulmonary artery embolisms. I'm sure many of the deaths that we're seeing are due to pulmonary artery embolisms and that patients are dying at home, both from coronary thrombosis as well as pulmonary artery embolisms. <clears throat> In our hospital early on, we learned that this is a big problem. Every single patient admitted to the hospital in my institution receives anticoagulation. Anybody who's been in my hospital for COVID who's gonna be going home is discharged with anticoagulation as well, usually at least two to four weeks of anticoagulation. And patients who are seen in an ambulatory setting or in our ER who are not gonna be admitted who are going home, if they are at moderate risk for COVID, 
um, then we will also prescribe anticoagulation to them as well. So if you have a patient you know, that's diabetic, hypertensive, a little obese, a little on the elderly side, we would definitely give anticoagulation to that patient. Um, you know, the younger population, <clears throat> if you have a 25 year old who is mildly sick, uh, we may not prescribe anticoagulation to that uh, young person. <clears throat> and this is what it looks like. I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but this is what it looks like um, when you see uh, blood clots. Um, you can see that the, where the first blue um, uh, marker is over here, uh, this is artery is full of blood clot in the proximal segment. As you follow the right coronary artery down, it bifurcates into a posterior descending artery. And what's missing over here is the posterior lateral branch of the right coronary. <clears throat> so we have evidence of clot in two locations within this blood vessel. Um, trying to recanalize all this in the face of blood clot um, can be successful, but due to the blood clot, it's usually much less successful than it would be if it was pure atherosclerotic disease. <clears throat> um, this is another case <clears throat> where you can see there's extensive clot in the right coronary artery, laminar clot basically coating the whole blood vessel from the catheter down to the mid portion of the right coronary artery. And when we look at the left coronary artery, you can see that there's a an abrupt occlusion of the left anterior descending, which should be coming out here. It's nothing but a stump. And you can see the circumflex is also full of blood clot with a little bit of dye going into this small obtuse marginal branch and this uh, LPL, left posterior lateral branch. Extensive blood clotting involving all three blood vessels, the right completely occluding the, uh, the, the left anterior descending and completely occluding this circumflex artery. <clears throat> this is uh, not survivable. <clears throat> <clears throat> this case was done by a colleague of mine, and you can see that he's already put some stents in down here into this LAD. This LAD comes down. It's supposed to go down to the apex down here and wrap around, um, but you can see where the stents are. I'll show you in a second. Let me freeze that for you. <clears throat> Whoop. Okay, can you freeze? So we'll go back up. But you can see over here that, that there's a, a stents that are down here, and despite putting stents in, there is no flow coming through the stents. So there was a clot over here that, that clotted up this, this person's left anterior descending artery. And despite putting a stent in, uh, the burden of blood clot was such that it basically just clotted up the stent right then and there. <clears throat> this is another patient who presented with diffuse ST elevations. Let's take a look here, two, three, AVF, uh, V3 through V6, ST elevations everywhere. And despite having a cardiogram that looks like the patient's having an ST elevation MI, when we bring that patient to the cath lab, you can see basically that this patient has normal coronary arteries. The left main's okay, circumflex is here, left anterior descending artery is fully patent all the way down to the apex. So if you take a look, here's the right coronary, also a large vessel, Timmy 3 flow throughout all the blood vessels. So despite having a picture that looks like ST elevation MI, this patient is having some sort of myocardial injury that mimics uh, an acute MI. <clears throat> Another view of that. All three blood vessels are patent with Timmy 3 flow. Here you can see a patient who has <clears throat> good LV function, but the apex is, is not moving well on the uh, left ventriculogram. So the the apical, this looks like an apical MI, more like a Takasubo pattern. This is a, uh, a social media post from my colleague. He's the chief of electrophysiology at Maimonides Medical Center, a 55 year old uh, young man um, who uh, presented with uh, COVID. Um, he became uh, more short of breath at home, came to the hospital, and wound up having to go to the intensive care unit. On CAT scan, what you notice over here of his CAT scan, there are multiple, um, uh, uh, multiple lesions, uh, bilateral uh, pneumonias, basically, uh, in both lungs, causing extreme shortness of breath. Um, and basically, uh, this was a plea from him while he was in the hospital that uh, he's worsening, he's desperate. Can anyone help get him the drug from Gilead remdesivir? Um, and uh, we tried our best to get him remdesivir, uh, but uh, they were pretty much out of compassionate use at the time. Uh, and uh, because he was late in the course when we asked for it, greater than 72 hours, they would not uh, release any remdesivir for him. Um, he made a desperate plea, you know, uh, that he's on the front lines in New York City and he's been on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin 
uh, but he, he, his disease process was progressing despite the medications. Um, and then he was asking to make compassionate use more available to, to those uh, in need. Subsequent, as you know, remdesivir has recently uh, gotten some favorable uh, results in, in the media and um, they are re releasing it now to us. Um, I hope you have the ability to get some remdesivir. It seems like it does have uh, some positive effect, at least on uh, reducing the, the length of illness. Uh, in this trial that they did perform, uh, the length of illness was reduced from 15 days of, of illness down to about 11 days. While the study was not powered to show a difference in mortality, there was a, a favorable trend uh, in mortality. Uh, so we, we think remdesivir as an adjuvant medical therapy uh, does have a place. This is another patient who presented with cardiomyopathy, and you can see in the apex of the left ventricle right here, there's a filling defect that, that is a clot sitting in the, this person's left ventricle. As you can tell, this ventricle is pretty much shot, very low ejection fraction uh, with an apical clot sitting there. Um, so this is a, um, somebody that's gravely ill and may not survive this. Um, <clears throat> In fact, um, part of our protocol, and I'll show you what our protocol is, but I, I try to get uh, echocardiography on the spot from our fellows. We send them out to the emergency room to evaluate patients, and I ask them to get a, an echocardiogram on every patient that is being evaluated for cardiac cath to understand what we're dealing with and whether or not these patients should come to the cath lab. And this is another echocardiogram, as you can see, fairly extensive uh, cardiomyopathy um, in all the panels, and it involves both the left ventricle and the right ventricle. So this is terrible, terrible uh, myocarditis that's affecting uh, this patient causing a cardiomyopathy. When we are inundated with patients, uh, not only do we see a lot of patients that come into the hospitals, uh, this, this is not by me, this is actually at NYU, but what you see here is a refrigerated, uh, refrigerated truck, Thermo King, that's a refrigeration unit. Um, the, the morgues, the amount of death that we were seeing uh, inundated uh, the, the, uh, uh, the hospital's morgue. Uh, we had no place to put patients that expired, and we had to bring in multiple 18-wheeler uh, trucks like this, freight, freight trucks, refrigerated trucks, uh, to store uh, the bodies. And in fact, um, the, uh, the funeral homes were also inundated. There was uh, no, there was a backlog. You couldn't get a proper funeral in a timely fashion um, because the, the funeral homes were inundated with, uh, with bodies. Um, in fact, they were actually trying to ship people upstate uh, outside New York City uh, to go ahead and, and give them a, a proper burial. Um, so it was very depressing to see that, obviously. So just as it can affect the left ventricle, I wanted to show you what it looks like when when uh, COVID affects the right ventricle. Um, and you can see here's the left ventricle banging away, looking pretty good. The mitral valve, aortic valve, the aorta here. And this structure up on top, this is the right ventricle. And as you can see, it, it's not really contracting well. When you see this, uh, this is a fairly bad sign. Uh, I always think of, you know, about pulmonary emboli when I see things like that. Uh, if you see a right ventricle that's blown out and not contracting well. Uh, but it can be just a cardiomyopathy that affected just the right ventricle. And here's what it looks like in the cross-sectional view. You can see the left ventricle contracting well here, uh, the, the right ventricle not so much. We've had tents like this. We put tents up uh, in our hospital, just on the side of our hospital, um, to take the overflow. So this is what can be done. Um, so I, I understand that your hospitals are, are filling up with COVID patients. So did ours. We were charged with doubling our capacity for this surge. Uh, that we were going to see and try to get ventilators and hospital beds. Uh, these are sort of portable beds, but uh, we had these mash units, mash tents, and we were not alone. Most hospitals did this. Um, Mount Sinai in New York actually put one of these large tents right in Central Park. Uh, many other hospitals uh, had them uh, in the parking lots uh, right outside the, the hospital um, for all the uh, surge and overflow of patients. When you see the right ventricle that's not contracting well, I always do think about pulmonary emboli. And so the CAT scanner is a wonderful, uh, wonderful device to help us make the diagnosis of COVID. You can see as my partner had bilateral infiltrates uh, within the lungs, this ground glass appearance. Um, so rather than waiting for you know, a PCR test or nasal swab to come back, which can take a day or more, um, you know, getting a CAT scan 
can show us uh, whether or not the patient has ground glass, ground, ground glass appearance um, in the lungs, and it also can show us whether or not the patient has uh, a pulmonary emboli. So what you see here is the pulmonary artery full of filling defect. This is a blood clot in the pulmonary artery, which as you know, can be fatal. Here's another view of that filling defect in the pulmonary artery showing the blood clot. And on angiography, this is what it looks like uh, when you have it. So here's a simple pigtail catheter in the pulmonary artery injection of dye. And what you see here is this white filling defect. This is an area that's dark from the dye. Uh, and here you can see that it's, it's very light and a little bit of uh, uh, paucity of blood vessel out here. Um, once the, there's a catheter that comes up to actually aspirate out this clot, uh, you can see now with this catheter here, the clot is aspirated. And now that area that was light right here is now dark, filling in with dye, which means we've aspirated out the blood clot. And you can see that now the, the distal vasculature is, is seen much more clearly here than it is up here. And the flow to the distal pulmonary bed is, is much better. And when you take a look at what you've aspirated out, you'll see all these different uh, blood clots just sitting there that was uh, going to kill the patient. But through all this, don't forget that we are cardiologists. This is the beautiful artery in the right. And do not forget that we can see just because we're in the COVID era, it does not mean that patients uh, cannot present with um, coronary artery disease. And this is a very bad left man. You see the catheter about to go into the coronary artery. It won't accept it in the coronary artery because the ostium of this left main is about 90, 90, 95% closed. And there's a lesion over here in the LAD as well. So um, just because we're in the COVID era, do not forget that we do still see patients who do have classical atherosclerotic heart disease and need to be treated as such. <clears throat> this was a short, short paper that came out from a couple of investigators, us included in New York. Very, very short, short paper. By the way, it just shows you how easy it is to get anything accepted to the New England Journal of Medicine these days. Uh, they, there's a short, short trial with only 18 patients uh, who had COVID and presented with an ST elevation indicating acute myocardial infarction. Median age of the patient was 63. Most were men. Uh, a third had chest pain around the time of the ST elevation. Only a third. Um, the others had chest, chest pain during their, uh, during their hospitalization. Um, so uh, a total of nine patients, 50%, only 50% underwent coronary angiography, even though they had ST elevations. Six of the patients had obstructive disease and five underwent PCI. Uh, but however, despite that, a total of 13 patients out of the 18 died in the hospital, um, showing you that, and, and four patients with myocardial infarction died and nine with non-coronary myocardial injury died. So this is a, a different process. It is not the same atherosclerotic heart disease that we are used to treating. Um, so taking them to the lab doesn't seem like it made a whole lot of difference in the outcome of these patients. Uh, and so you have to think back and say, you know, what are we really treating? Most interventional cardiologists have this idea that we can cure the world. We have special gifts, special talents. We can open up anybody's artery and stop a heart attack. And you know, in the, in the pre-COVID era, that's pretty true and we all feel pretty good about it. But I will tell you, if, for those of us who, who've done interventions on clotted thrombotic vein grafts, think of these vessels like a clotted thrombotic vein graft that's full of clot from top to bottom. You can push it, pull it, aspirate it, put stents into it, but the outcome of these thrombotic vein grafts are terrible. Similarly, the outcome of these COVID patients with the thromb thrombotic milieu that they have the outcome of intervention on these patients is not good. And even though you might be able to get a stent in there, as I showed you before, the stent may not stay patent. The long-term patency of a patient with COVID in a hypercoagulable state uh, may not be what you think it's gonna be in a non-COVID patient. So putting a stent in the COVID era to somebody who has COVID, in my opinion, is probably not a good thing to do. It's probably best if you can get them through the, uh, the, the COVID era and get, get them COVID free and then bring them back then you can put a stent in much more safely with better outcome. Um, so in conclusion, the authors of this study, and we were involved with this, in the series of patients of COVID-19 who had ST elevation, there was variability in presentation and a high prevalence of non-obstructive disease and a poor prognosis, uh, which got us to think, and there's been reports from China uh, about how to handle these patients. And the, the Chinese, um, they actually thought that uh, trying thrombolytics is not a bad idea. And I'll tell you, when I have clotted main grafts that are full of clot from top to bottom, 
uh, that's what I, I think is also a good therapy is to try to treat the clot uh, the best way that we can. And sometimes we have to go back and think about using thrombolytics. So this new pandemic era is forcing us to reconsider some of our accepted approaches to acute my care and other vascular thrombotic events. Uh, one of the many manifestations of COVID is diffuse microthrombi in the pulmonary artery. We know that from autopsy studies, there's clots going everywhere, peripheral circulation to the lung, to the kidney, to the brain. Um, and fibrin fibrinolytic therapy should be potentially helpful in these patients. Uh, now, everybody realizes that primary PCI is the best mode of therapy in the non-COVID era, uh, but um, you should consider uh, thrombolytic therapy in these patients. One, if you have a problem or delay transferring patients from one hospital to the other. Two, if you're not sure the status of the patient and exposure of your entire cath lab staff, uh, you could use thrombolytic therapy and not expose um, your entire staff to the COVID uh, virus. And uh, lastly, when there's diffuse clot everywhere, um, my, my experience has been that trying to uh, open up those arteries with standard therapy with balloons and stents uh, will not give you the same result that you would have in a non-COVID patient. This is our, uh, our anticoagulation protocol. Uh, all patients admitted with COVID-19 uh, without, without a bleeding risk wind up on anticoagulation. Uh, feel free to, uh, to use this if you choose to. Um, I'm sure there are others uh, that are out there, but we find this to be pretty reasonable. Uh, and in conclusion, this is a novel disease uh, from a novel virus. We've never seen anything like this before. The uh, transmissibility of this disease is unprecedented. Uh, it infected the entire planet. Uh, there's been there's been you know viral outbreaks and pandemics uh, before, but think about it. This 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 disease has traveled, and aside from Antarctica, I don't know of a single country that is COVID free. The entire planet is infected by this virus. This is not your typical coronary artery disease when you see the patient. These patients are in a hypercoagulable state. Cardiac complications of COVID equals a poor prognosis. Uh, anticoagulation in these patients is important. Consideration should be given to fibrinolytic therapy. And if you have a sudden change in the course of your patient, uh, suspect a, a, an acute pulmonary embolism. And I'll be happy to accept any kind of questions you can throw at me. Thank you very much. Great, um, Dr. Franco, thank you very much. I think it was a very comprehensive and great presentation. I really appreciate your uh, coming up this early in New York in the East Coast area to get up and give us this presentation. Um, uh, one question uh, that uh, kept on coming was that um, from the anticoagulation perspective, uh, with a novel uh, oral anticoagulant, do you think the safety wise you uh, are as comfortable as an oxaparin or some other ones in which you can have some reversal agents like Abixaban that I saw that uh, was on the screen? Yes. So. So there has been an increase with the, uh, in uh, uh, bleeding complications, uh, you know, in cerebral bleeds as well. And I think, you know, if you have an agent that you can reverse, uh, that would be good. You know, with the novel, with the, with the newer, with the NOACs, DOACs, whatever you want to call them, uh, apparently uh, they're, the reversal agents are extremely expensive. Uh, we in Brooklyn do not have uh, the reversal agent for some of those DOACs. Uh, so anoxaparin is, is, is a good thing, good choice, but um, yes, there is definitely a risk of, of bleeding and um, reversibility would be good, but we, we can't afford it. It's, I understand the reversal agents for the, some of the DOACs in, in New York is about $25,000 a dose. Um, and oftentimes by the time you need it, it's too late. Uh, oftentimes the bleed has already done its damage. So giving that is just too late. Good question, Cameron. Uh <laughs> no, these are the questions coming from the participants, so I'm just moderating, so I wanted to ask. Another question that came was that, do you do um, COVID uh, testing before bringing patients to cath lab? Do you have the rapid COVID testing with you or not yet? So we have rapid COVID testing. I haven't found it to be that rapid. Uh, so it takes us about, uh, about an hour, I'd say, to get a rapid test. So when we bring patients in from the, uh, from the emergency room, we're fortunate to have uh, several cath labs in our hospital. So what I've done is I designated one cath lab as quote unquote hot lab or COVID lab. So all patients who are coming in from the street uh, where we do not know the COVID status, we are suspecting COVID and we put everybody into that one cath lab, leaving the other two cath labs completely clean. Obviously after the patient is off the table, it's all 
uh, sterilized and, and uh, wiped down with a cleaning solution. Um, but, uh, but the answer is no, we don't usually find out about it. So what we've done in our protocol, um, I've asked them to, if you're not sure, if we can't get the rapid test is to try to get the patient a CAT scan. So on the way in, it's pretty rapid that we can get a quick CAT scan. CAT scan is pretty sensitive uh, for showing uh, the bilateral ground glass appearance of the infiltrates. And if they're positive for that, uh, then we'll suspect COVID. In addition to that, uh, I try to get an echocardiogram on them prior to coming into the cath lab to see if they have some sort of cardiomyopathy. Okay, great. How about um, you guys? Let me, ask you. Let me ask you, what is the uh, ability to test your patients uh, in Pakistan? No, it's very uh, limited uh, testing ability. I mean, most of the time I believe that, um, I mean, so far 30,000 patients in Pakistan have been confirmed, diagnosed, and that's because of our limitation of testing. I think we have a big burden of disease, but we are not able to test people. Um, my practice has been that I actually uh, deal with everyone as if they are potentially carriers and they can transmit disease. So um, all precautions are going to be practiced the same way. Um, but overall, I think our limitation is that we can't test and we don't have rapid testing in Pakistan at all. So it takes about 72 hours for us to know if someone is positive. Right. So um, I would, yeah, go ahead. So that's pretty much where we were. Uh, our testing usually took uh, more than a few days. The first test that I took, took me, I got tested because my partner was so sick. Uh, they tested me and it took six days to get my test back. So uh, almost useless. Hmm. But now with the rapid test, it makes it a little bit easier and it makes it a little bit easier to know where to put those patients after the procedure, right? So do they go to a regular ICU do they, or they go to the medical ICU with COVID patients if they're COVID positive? Uh, so it's important down the road to figure out where you're gonna, how you're gonna cohort all of these different patients. And then as, you, as we're coming back to normal now, we still have a combination of COVID patients and normal patients. And then we, we need to know who's okay to go for a major open heart surgery. You know, you don't really wanna take a patient with COVID to the operating room, uh, their complication rates would be much higher because they're hypercoagulable. So prior to any kind of surgical procedure, we now insist that patients get tested beforehand so we know whether or not they're COVID positive to allow them to go for surgery. Correct. Um, I would come to the panel of experts. Uh, Professor Dr. Harun Aziz Khan, um, if you're on board, I would like uh, if you have any question or comment um, for the panel or the speaker here. Uh, Professor Harun, I think you still need to unmute it, please. Please, yes. Yes. Are you are, are you able to listen to me now? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Yes, yes, sorry. Uh, it was a nice and a very comprehensive presentation from Dr. Robert Frankel. We, uh, definitely, we learned a lot from him. I want to ask him, what is the incidence of myocarditis uh, in relation to COVID-19? Is, has it been proved that it causes myocarditis? Um, yes, yes. Uh, it, it, on autopsy studies, they do see signs of inflammation. Um, so they, they do believe that there, might, there is myocarditis. Um, and when you have a release of enzyme, so wh whether, you, whether you make the diagnosis um, on a slide or you make it clinically, um, most of us in the front line, you know, when we see somebody with a wall motion abnormality and, and uh, release of enzymes, we, we think that there's a, a myocarditis uh, component to it. So we do see many patients, probably 40, 50% that present with um, some form of uh, troponin release uh, when, they, when they present to the emergency room. And are these the patients who already have ischemic heart disease or cardiovascular disease, or they are the patients uh, without any other cardiovascular stigmata? So about half the patients have, have non-obstructive disease, no coronary artery disease. Usually it's, if they present with ST elevation, it's just a pure clot thrombosis. Uh, but oftentimes you can even have myocarditis with good flow, uh, with normal, normal flows down the coronary arteries. So this virus does affect the heart, uh, causing a, a myocarditis, even in those patients without coronary artery disease, 50% of the time. 
it may be related to the inflammatory process going on in the body because of the virus itself. I would agree with that. Yeah. Thank you. Nation. Professor Solid Siddiq um, is the president of Pakistan Hypertension League. Uh, I would request him for his comments, his input, please. <clears throat> We can't hear you. Yes. Can you hear Dr. Solit? No, I can't hear Dr. Solit. Uh, in the meanwhile, I can request uh, Professor Khalda Sumro um, if. Uh, She's the ex-president of Pakistan Cardiac Society. Uh, kindly, if you can unmute and uh, uh, give us your comments, please. Can you hear me? Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes, Professor Khalda, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, very excellent uh, presentation by Dr. Robert uh, Robert. My question, uh, rather than a comment, is that uh, in initial data, which was given um, to um, media and social media every, and in literature, that women are less likely to suffer from the COVID-19, especially if we are talking about the cardiovascular impact and its mortality. So what, from all these days, uh, what is the uh, global data of women involvement in uh, with the, the COVID-19 and its mortality? Is this uh, initial uh, comment was right or not? So because of the, um, the connection, I had a difficult time hearing. Uh, could you just restate that, Cameron, for me? What, what is uh, she's saying that in Pakistan, what we are seeing is uh, that uh, the ladies, the female patients are less uh, affected by COVID-19. Yeah. So is yes. that true uh, from cardiovascular point of view in your observation at Centre? Yes, we, we see the same thing here in New York. Um, it, it, the uh, males are more affected than females. Um, and, uh, it seems to affect patients also, I think, with other risk factors, obviously, hypertension, diabetes. And um, the other thing that I see is, is a little bit of obesity. Um, patients that, that are a little bit rotund and a little bit obese uh, seem to be affected more and have a more severe illness uh, than those patients that are normal weight or lightweight. So that seems to be the reason why the initial studies on the women are giving the, the correct data. Thank yes. you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Feroz Bayman, uh, if you would uh, kindly join us and give us um, your comment or if you have any questions, please. <laughs> Professor Dr. Feroz Bayman is also ex-president Pakistan yeah. Cardiac Society. Can you unmute me so that I can talk? Uh, we can hear you, actually. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Kamran. It was an excellent presentation. I liked it. I was just wondering that I mean, initially we still lack in testing, and obviously the testing what we see in Pakistan is about 12% like coming positive, and that is also true that there are very few testing being done. It's not as per requirement of interest standard. Now, I do not know how many children are suffering and what is the mortality of morbidity in children. Is there any information about that? So, yes. So, children under the age of 10 years, I mean. Yeah, children, children um, seem to be less affected. However, they are definitely being infected, um, as are pregnant women. 
Um, so I'll tell you what's happening in New York. We, we published, we probably have one of the largest and busiest uh, OB uh, practices in the city of New York. We usually do about this hospital over 9,000, between nine and 10,000 deliveries a year. We've just published a, a case series of 152 pregnant women uh, who were positive for COVID. Uh, so it, it affects pregnant women, it affects children. And there is now, uh, we've had six cases of what we call a, a, a Kawasaki-like type illness due to COVID. You'll probably be reading about that shortly. Uh, New York State has just requested us to submit our data to them. Um, so these kids present with what looks like Kawasaki uh, with cardiac involvement, uh, and they can have sudden cardiac arrest, heart failure, and things like that in, in the pediatric population. So they are not immune from this, and there's a specific Kawasaki-like disease that is associated with children. So look just out for one that. More, just one more question. Would this uh, COVID-induced myocarditis, would uh, steroids would be any help in this patient? That's, that's a great question. So, you know, initially, uh, the, the initial reports were that steroids were not helpful, um, but institutions uh, are having some success in selected population with high dose steroids. So I would agree with you. There's not a lot that we can do to treat this illness. So if I thought that there was a myocarditis, uh, I certainly would give a shot for uh, some high dose steroid. Only, uh, again, none of this, that is not really proven, but it's something I think better. Correct. Something is better than nothing. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, good, good point. Are you guys using hydroxychloroquine? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. Anybody taking it there prophylactically? Yes, we are using it prophylactically. Good, good. So am I. <laughs> what, 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 what's the prophylaxis regime for this? Uh, thing? So, uh, you know, I, I think I'm taking the malarial dose of 400 milligrams a, a week. Um, that's all, just 400 milligrams, two tablets, 400 milligrams on a weekly basis. Um, and then how many weeks? Doing. Seven weeks or three weeks? You know, I'm taking it as long as the virus is around. I think I'm going to take it. <laughs> okay, How long good. would you take it? Yeah. How long continue, would you take? continue taking it. <laughs> you take malarial. How long, how long would you take malarial prophylaxis? You know, if you're... Usually, if you're in a, usually four to six weeks. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. I think okay. as long as you're in that area, the high endemic okay. area. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. What's your name, Aslam? Would you like to uh, join, please? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kamran. Uh, it is a really nice presentation. We have uh, been discussing before this presentation of this excellent question of hydroxychloroquine. Uh, this is a big question of prolongation of QT interval. We have been using uh, HCQ since long for a disease, and we have really noticed any really noticed any prolongation of QT interval. What is the incidence here in the New York and states? So. Cameron, you have to rephrase it because it was breaking up a little bit. Go ahead. No, I also had the interruption. Uh, Professor, name kindly repeat, please. Okay. Uh, we have been using, are still using hydroxychloroquine for, prophylaxis, for, for prophylaxis as well as for malaria. And in some patients for uh, rheumatoid arthritis or for long use for months and months. And we did really notice any prolongation of QT interval here. What is your experience for in New York? Uh, about this QT interval prolongation in arrhythmias? So, so uh, you know, I'm not the electrophysiologist here, uh, but I will tell you that um, we, we uh, I haven't seen it cause a lot of uh, QT prolongation, but we do not start it unless, if the um, QT corrected interval is greater than 440, 450 milliseconds, we will not start it. Uh, so, uh, but I have not seen it um, cause problems and need to be removed. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. There was an other comments that I was saying that in New York and other, uh, in Italy, the mortality was very high among the older group of the patient was 60 and 70s. And, but in, in our center here in Faisalabad, the dedicated hospital to COVID, it is a very interesting thing that the patients who are above 60, they came out of ventilator and the patients who are in 40s, they come up. So the mortality was very high in this in, in 40s and 50s in, in this uh, in our region. And all the patients was quite thin, slim, non-obese, with without any comorbidities. They were non-diabetic, non-hypertensive, non-smoker, right. and right. 
other the patient who are comorbid, they go, they should good recovery and came out of the hospital. This is very strange, and we are just working on it. We don't know what is the reason here. That's that's a very interesting finding. Um, in New York, it hasn't been that way, but you would think that the younger person, the younger patient, would have a, a more intact immune system, causing a hyperimmune uh, cytokine storm response. Perhaps it has to do with the ability of, of the younger person to uh, elicit the cytokine storm, uh, whereas the elderly um, or the infirm, those patients with comorbidities, um, they, can't, they can't survive the hypoxia, uh, the cardiomyopathy, and the insult. But you may be seeing a higher population with cytokine storm. We had also so many children who was admitted with COVID positive in our hospital. One was one year, three years, seven years, nine years, and our main here for 14 days, uh, but luckily they are recovered and went home. But all uh, their the youngest was one year who was COVID positive. Wow. That's very, very good. Very Mr. Solid Sadiq, um, would you care to uh, give a comment or ask a question? Uh, yes, uh, I was interested to uh, find out that they're doing echoes in all the patients that uh, they end up in the emergency, at least they encourage it. So uh, what when they find out that the SPs are uh, elevated like uh, an ECG that was shown, uh, but the echo is normal, do you still take them to the angiogram uh, lab or you just... Uh, no, I, I, do, I do not. So in those cases, we, we defer from cardiac catheterization. Um, you know... I'm probably in the minority. Most interventional cardiologists think that they can cure the world with a catheter. This is not your standard coronary artery disease case. Um, so if we don't think that the patient has clear-cut uh, STEMI, we will try not to, to bring them to the cath lab. I don't think that there's a lot of good that can come out of being in the cath lab unless you have atherosclerotic heart disease. This is a different disease process, and the success rates of primary PCI are not going to be the same as with atherosclerotic heart disease. I think that's a big point that most interventional cardiologists uh, are not getting, uh, but it's, it, it is not your standard disease. This is a different disease that we've never seen before, and it doesn't behave the same way. So um, we try to limit those patients. If they have COVID positive um, and the LV function is normal, we will not take them to the cath lab. Thank Professor you. Dr. Abdul Rashid Khan, um, you have a question I see. Would you like to ask uh, to our uh, worthy speaker? Thank you, Emily, for a nice presentation. Can I Thank ask you. one question? Which anticoagulant would you like to recommend and for how long in this COVID-19 patient, as you mentioned, that it is the, it is the, it is the high uh, coagulation in these patients? Yeah, so, so anybody who comes into the hospital, we're giving everybody that comes into the hospital anticoagulation. And then when they leave the hospital, we're letting them go home with somewhere between two weeks and four weeks of anticoagulation, depending on what, their, what we think their bleeding risk is. Um, so uh, if you can take a look at this slide here, I don't know if you can still see it. We are using a, a, an oxaparin. Um, we are using some heparin as well. Um, and um, when we treat, we also are using a, a pixaban in our patients. So anybody that is hospitalized, I believe should be, if the risks are not too high, should be on anticoagulation because uh, autopsy studies have shown you know, diffuse thrombosis uh, throughout the, the body, uh, peripheral circulation, pulmonary, lungs, uh, brain, and, and kidney. Um, so it's really, I think it's very important to be on an anticoagulant. There's clearly risks to anticoagulating these patients, but I can tell you that when you don't anticoagulate them, you will see cold legs, cold extremities, uh, strokes, uh, pulmonary emboli, sudden death uh, for presumed pulmonary emboli. Um, so um, we are anticoagulating everybody, and when they go home, two to four weeks worth. Usually a picture. Thank, Thank you very much. You're welcome. Lastly, um, Professor Ijaz Ahmed is uh, the head of Multan Institute Cardiology. Uh, I would request if he has any question or comment. Yeah, Pixaban is not available in Pakistan. Can we use River Oxaban instead? Certainly. Certainly. All right then. 
thank you very much, everyone, for your time and attention. I think it was a great session. We all learned um, from each other. Um, Dr. Frankel, I really appreciate uh, your uh, pain and stakes that you took to um, materialize this session, and I really appreciate your contribution. Um, thank you very much, for all sense. Um, I, would, I would like to close the session at this time. If um, any uh, word of thanks from Ferozens, that would be great. Thank you very much, participants. One, one more comment, two more comments for you. Yes, yes. About testing. Testing is important to try to triage the patient to the most appropriate level of care. Um, you know, we are trying to segregate out a hot zone, a cold zone, and a warm zone. So hot, obviously, if they're COVID positive, cold if they're clean, if the status is unknown, then we call it a warm zone, and we try to separate the patients out that way so as not to propagate the spread. But just remember that these tests are not always accurate, especially there's a, there's a high rate of false negatives, even in the best of testing, and we're spending thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars in testing, um, and the, the false negative rates are pretty high, probably about 30%, up to 30% false negatives. So on, on an anecdotal note, personally, I will tell you that my, uh, uh, my son, who's 31, 32 years old, um, had fevers to 102 and a half. He had cough. Uh, he had uh, weight loss. He lost 12 pounds of weight. And he had fevers for 10 days. And I was certain he had COVID. And we did uh, two nasal swabs, not one, but two nasal swabs on him. And both nasal swabs came up negative. Despite that, I still treated him with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. And two days later, he, he got better. And um, now he's completely uh, back to normal. And uh, this past weekend, I actually did an antibody test on him. And it turns out he uh, was markedly positive for antibodies uh, to the COVID virus. So, you know, as good as these, these tests are, you still need to use your clinical judgment because they're not 100% accurate. So uh, just because you don't have the test, don't feel that you're that far behind. You know, I treated my own son with uh, some, some drugs, which are not really mainstream, based on a clinical, uh, clinical decision. And uh, so stick to your, what you know, stick to your, your, your fine skills of clinicians uh, and treat them that way and, and you'll be very, very good. And lastly, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with all of you. Uh, these virtual conferences are new to me. Uh, I've never done this before. Um, and I do hope uh, in the near future, when we eradicate this virus, that I will come and give you guys a, a lecture uh, in person in Pakistan. That will be great. That will be great. A word of thank from Usman Saab, uh, the head of uh, uh, Fluorescence here in Pakistan. I would request Usman Saab to give his final words. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamran. And a, a really uh, grateful note of thank you uh, to you, Dr. Frankel, for um, you know, coming on from the front lines where you're battling this disease in such large volumes every day. People very close to you have been affected so deeply by it. And in addition to that, you woke up so early on a Sunday morning. So we're really very grateful. Uh, we, want to thank, <laughs> we want to thank uh, 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 Dr. Kamran Babur, of course, the Pakistan Cardiac Society, uh, Professor Harun Aziz Babur, who's the current president of the society, Mr. Saudat Sadiq, uh, president of the Hypertension League, and other experts, Professor Feroz Mehman, uh, Professor uh, uh, Khalida Sumro, and uh, Dr. Abdul Rashid Khan, who joins us regularly for these sessions. We're very grateful for the time all of you gave. All of you are the real heroes in this uh, uh, really tragic pandemic. Uh, you're facing the uh, risk, high level of risks every day uh, to protect your patients and their families. And we really, on behalf of Rose Sons, I would like to express our gratitude for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Great. you very much. Have a good day and have a good, good evening, everyone. And happy Mother's Day to all the mothers in the session. Thank you. <laughs> happy holidays, everybody. Great hearing Thank from you. you. We'll talk later. Thank you. Inshallah. God willing. Thank you very much, Dr. Frankel. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. It.